Thank you, Sharon. Before we start and look at the word of the Lord together, uh, would you just bow your heads in a moment of prayer with me? Father God, we thank you for this precious word that we're going to look at today. This word that is who you are and who you teach us to be. Often I wonder, Lord, who am I to stand up here and proclaim this word? So, Father, I pray that it would be your Holy Spirit going before us and that you'd be the one giving us these words. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this Sunday, we're continuing on a series that's called Built Differently, uh, all through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And the section that we're in today, in my Bible, it's headed Final Instructions. Uh, Paul is focusing on what it looks like to be built differently in a world where culture at that time was pushing in on the Christians. But as I was reading the letter, I kind of had to first think about the word letter. Like, when is the last time that you've gone to your mailbox and you've gotten a handwritten note or letter from somebody? I don't know about you, but there is something about slitting open that envelope and pulling out handwritten thoughts. It just kind of makes my heart really happy. So imagine this. This is the only communication that the Thessalonian church will get, and they get this letter from Paul. Imagine the excitement. He knows that they are being persecuted, and he wants to reconnect with the church and say, hang in there, brothers and sisters. We're praying, and I've got you, and I hope to come back soon. So that was a really exciting letter for them to receive. He reminds them that they have to increase in holiness. They have to increase in love. They have to be sexually pure. They have to serve and love others. Now, at the end of the last or the beginning of chapter five, uh, last week, Pastor Chris talked about how they were waiting for the second coming and that they should live counterculturally. And that was an interesting thing because I'm just thinking for us now, if you're met with somebody who is hostile to you, how easy is it to love them back? Who serves an enemy? And yet that's the instruction the Thessalonian church got, and that's the instruction that we're getting. We're to be motivated by love and hope, but most of all, because we know what our hope is in the coming future. Now, there is another thing about this letter that I really loved, and it's how Paul talks about it. Five different times he says, brothers and sisters, which means he is saying specifically to this church, we are family. We do things together. We love one another. We care for one another. So I am going to go through this uh, literally verse by verse because that's kind of how I like to make sure I don't miss anything. And this is a short piece, but it's got some really great stuff in it. So verses 12 and 13. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you. Imagine how I enjoyed that verse. Who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Now, as Trenton was praying, I thought, isn't it amazing how God works things in? He had us pray for pastors and office bearers. And I have in my notes an odd request. Would all the elders and deacons who are present this morning please stand? I know you're here. There you are. Excellent. Would all those, please stay standing, would all those who lead a ministry of some kind, please stand. Isn't that awesome? Oh, if there's staff members here, you can stand too. (laughs) Sorry. These are the people in leadership. These are the people we pray for. You may be seated. I was thinking of doing that last, last, uh, last week, so I was excited when I heard Trenton pray that. Now, it's not an accident that I've wanted them to stand up, because as I was looking at the Greek text, uh, the word care is a Greek word prostemi, and it actually literally means standing before or in front of. Isn't that amazing? So it's not a light task. 
this task of leadership, and it's not something to be trifled with. The task of pastors, of council members, and ministry leaders is an important job. You're supposed to expose false teaching. You're supposed to rebuke and care for, possibly admonish those that are in your care. It's not a dictatorial kind of thing, but it is an authority, and it is God-given. And notice that in a battle, the people that are standing in front of you, guess what? They get hit first. So that is why we pray for leadership, because they literally stand in front of to be protection for. Now, when we install elders and deacons, often it can be a little bit lighthearted. And yet we promise these very words, sustain them in prayer and encourage them with our support, especially when they feel the burden of their office. Can I just say this? Assume that the leaders are feeling the burden of their office. So make it a habit to regularly encourage those who stood up, those who stand in leadership. Make it a habit to give appreciation because that goes a long way. They should not hear from you only when there's an issue, but also just as an encouragement. So pray for them. The live in peace with each other in verse 13. Yes. It seems to indicate that there was some kind of unrest that was happening in the church. And so this is obviously contrary to what God is asking of us. So the phenomenon that we would experience now is one that I call church shopping. And this happens all too regularly. I'm not happy with this person. I'm going to go to another church. I don't like this. I'm going to go to another church. Now, there are some times when, for the unity of the church, someone needs to leave. But in most times, it is because there was a hard conversation that didn't happen. Live in peace. You're going to hear me repeat this several times. Paul asked that God himself, the God of peace, would bless the church and sanctify them through and through to be built differently. Let's move on to verses uh, 14 and 15. This deals with uh, the relationship of church members to each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. There's some great verbs here. Um, Encourage, help, be patient, strive to do good. Those are all action words that end in peace. You notice that? So when Paul's talking about those who are idle and disruptive, when we see the word idle, we right away think lazy. But instead, what he's referring to is people that are not working to their full capacity. Those of you that are hardcore Calvinists know that we value working hard. Here, Paul is actually saying, when you're doing a job, do it to the best of your ability. Give it what everything that you've got. Um, Paul is referring to those who are disordered. They're not remaining in the place that they're supposed to be in. They're out of order. They're undisciplined. And it's specifically, he's talking to those who are undisciplined in their faith, because they're breaking three commitments. They're breaking their commitment to God, They're breaking their commitment to the fellowship, and they're breaking their commitment to one another. Not just working hard to support themselves. In this case, they're spending their time being what we would call busybodies. In Thessalonica, the churches, some of the Christians were out of order because they were working hard spreading false teaching, which is why we are going to be warned later on about false teaching. So can we relate to that today? I think we can. I know uh, for sure there's one church in the city that focuses on eschatology, $5 word for end time prophecies. And all they're doing is figuring out when Christ will return. When very specifically in the chapter, or in the part of the chapter before this one, we are told not to be consumed with that, but we are to be ready. So don't worry about what the date is, just make sure you're ready. We're supposed to encourage the timid. We're supposed to be at peace with everybody. We're supposed to not neglect those in need. And we have to not retaliate when others treat us poorly. None of those are easy. 
When someone slanders my reputation, you can bet your boots I want to slander theirs. And God is saying here, no, be quiet. Keep your mouth shut. As a matter of fact, I want you to pray for them and bless them. Now that is homework we all can work on. And I don't exclude myself from it. Paul asks that God himself, the God of peace, would bless the church and sanctify them through and through so that they are built differently. Verse 16 to 18. I actually kind of split these out and they become great instructions. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. Those are short verses, but every verse, if you notice, is central to Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus Christ is asking of us. Leon Morris characterizes the early Christians in this way. They thought more of their Lord than of their difficulties, more of their spiritual riches in Christ than of their poverty on earth, and more of the glorious future when Christ would come than that of their unhappy past. That's a tough one, especially in view of some of the things that have happened in church. There's been a few deaths this week, and they've been hard to handle. So rejoice always. How on earth do we do that? Does that mean in the Psalms where he's lamenting, we're not allowed to lament? Are we allowed to mourn? Are we allowed to cry? What about when we suffer pain or loss? Romans 8 verse 28 says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Can I be honest? I hate it when people pull that one out when I'm sad. Because do I genuinely believe that? The only way we can believe that is if we know that Jesus Christ sat on earth, suffered for us, felt what we feel, Paul says that in the end, our joy in Christ Jesus is what overcomes our sorrow. He doesn't say we won't have sorrow. He says Jesus Christ, our relationship with him, is what helps us overcome it. When I looked at this, I thought, this is all about gratitude. This is all about living a Christ-centered idea where we, we look at him and we're grateful for who he is and how he has saved us. Having joy through all circumstances or all things, even when there's great trouble and suffering. It's not an emotional high. As a matter of fact, I don't even think having joy in a hardship is natural, but it is something the Holy Spirit gives us. So yes, we can express sorrow and we can lament, but in that sorrow, we also fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, who is our hope for eternity. He is our joy for the end time victory. So rejoice always. Paul then instructs that we pray continually. He thanks God for how he has answered our prayers, and he thanks God for his characteristics, and he thanks God that his sin has been forgiven. 20th century German theologian Dietrich Baumhofer, John Baumhofer wrote his short book, Life Together, as a guide for learning in seminary. As a matter of fact, the end of that story is this seminary was started during the Nazi rule in Germany. And Bonhoeffer started this seminary far away from the city as his, um, his comment on what was happening. He says this, The unity of prayer and work, the unity of the day, is found because finding the you of God behind the it of the day's work is what Paul means by his admonition to pray without ceasing. The prayer of the Christian reaches, therefore, beyond the time allocated to it and extends into the midst of work. It surrounds the whole day, and in so doing, it doesn't hinder the work. It promotes work, affirms work, gives work great significance and joyfulness. Thus, every word, every deed, every piece of work of the Christian becomes a prayer not in the unreal sense of being constantly distracted from the task that must be done, but in the real breakthrough from the hard it to the gracious you. We often call these popcorn prayers. I'm driving, I see something, it reminds me of someone, and I quickly pray about it. I'm not distracted from driving, 
but I am praying. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. This is God's will. So we are to be thankful for our blessings and grateful for Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're thanking God for evil or evil circumstances, but we are grateful and thanking him for his continual presence in our lives. We know that trials are going to happen, but we also know that he's going to sanctify us or set us apart, make us holy. In fact, through all of that, he will be glorified. Paul asks that God himself, the God of peace, would bless the church and sanctify us through and through so that we are built differently. Let's move on to um, verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Well, I'll bet you were wondering what on earth I was going to say about that. It is something we don't preach about very often, and I actually was kind of excited to look into it. The message prayer phrase says, don't suppress the spirit and don't stifle those who have a word from the master. The Thessalonica church was so busy making sure they lived a right life that some of the more miraculous gifts of the spirit were a little bit worrying to them. They had a lot of head knowledge, but the heart knowledge was just a little harder to come by. So Paul wants their worship from going from deeply religious to becoming deeply spiritual balance. And with that freedom, he's reminding these brothers and sisters in Christ that you don't live a life where anything goes. Rather, he says, test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. In their spiritual practice, they were to test everything. Every truth claim, every ethic claim, much the way that people test metal. As a matter of fact, what it's referring to here in the Greek is a process of heating up ore so that impurities come out of it. Christians are to live critically in a world that is filled with fool's gold. When I was 14 years old, uh, and actually with Sharon, who read the Bible this morning, our two families uh, did a trip to Alaska, and on the way, we stopped in Dawson Creek. Dawson Creek, known for its gold, uh, its gold panning. And so we, with many others, sat there with our big pans and sifted it out, and got a few little flecks of gold. And then the rest of the process was you had to go to the assay office to have it certified as real gold. Totally fascinating. I find out that in the 1840s, fool's gold, or um, iron pyrate, was so common that many of them thought they had the real gold, but instead it was the fool's gold. But they found out what they had when they went to the assay office to have it tested. And that is what we are supposed to do with prophecies. Because prophecies are words of truth and comfort. Sometimes they're words that move us forward in a, in a rebuke. And we have to listen carefully to them. We can't ignore them, but we do have to test them. What Paul is basically saying, and the word doesn't translate to gullible, but it's pretty close. He says, don't stifle the word, but don't be gullible. Test it out. When I was part of a dunamis course, we often were talking about how do you test out what is said. And we were given this really great bookmark. Um, You'd have to talk to Joanne Rosendahl if you want one, but it's really great. And it says discernment tests to see if the Holy Spirit's really at work. And this is what it says. Number one, does it give glory to Jesus Christ in the present and in the future? First test. Second one is this. Is it consistent with the intentions and character of God as revealed in scripture? Does it line up? Third, do other people who are filled with the Holy Spirit have a confirming witness? This is very important. Do they agree? Does it sound right to them? And four, is there confirmation in objectively verifiable events or facts? Has this happened before? Is it consistent? Do other people give witness to it? Those are the things that you can check up. Now, 1 Corinthians also confirms this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.40 says this, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So these prophecies shouldn't be causing panic. 
It's something we just work through to make sure it's true. Paul says, don't quench the spirit, but do test. He says that God himself, asks that God himself, the God of peace, would bless the church and sanctify it through and through so that we would be built differently. Let's talk about verses 23 and 24, which are basically a prayer. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is a prayer for us. Paul reminds us about the instructions in the letter and that they're only completed because God gives us gracious provision. He's a God of perfect peace, and he enables us to be at peace. He is sanctifying us, setting us apart, making us holy, and helping us to experience greater peace as we grow with him. And as we are sanctified, we are better able to carry out what he asks us to do, to be his witness in the world. There is one problem with all of this, and that is us. I want to look at the Romans 7, 18 to 25 in the message paraphrase, because it's a lot more understandable. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best efforts, my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to, be de- not to do bad, and then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions, where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, and am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. I loved the part where it says, Jesus Christ can and does. He will do in us the very thing that he wants from us. And we can be sure that God will do this, Because the one who has called us to this new life, this life of being built differently than those in culture, he is faithful. He's kept all the promises that he made in his word, which means we can count on him. He is faithful to the end. God does things that are impossible for us. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I get stuck in. But by God's grace, he pulls me out of that and he teaches me how to live a sanctified life. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That's why Paul asked that God himself, the God of peace, would bless the church and sanctify us through and through to be built differently. Before we go into the last few verses, I'd like to ask the band to come forward. Let's look at those last few verses, verses 25 to 27. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So here is Paul talking to the Thessalonian church and saying, would you pray for me? I stand in need of your prayer support. And what he's really asking is that he too experiences the peace that he's been praying over the Thessalonian church. I just want to hit that holy kiss thing before we're all kissing each other. It is a Middle Eastern thing where men would kiss each other on the cheek as a greeting. It's a very physical sign of showing affection or greeting to one another. 
So what's unusual about the request here is this. He is asking that they would show this sign of peace between Jews and Greeks. Imagine that. Between slaves and free. This now becomes a very physical way of showing, I'm in one accord with you. We are brothers in Christ. What a beautiful, beautiful act. If I were to sum up the end of this letter to the Thessalonian church, it would be to say that these, these instructions that Paul is giving us, these instructions for holy living, are an expression of gratitude to God for what he has sacrificed for us. You'll find that in the Heidelberg Catechism, the last part is all dedicated to our gratitude or our service to God because we are so grateful for what he's done for us. It's hard to live a holy life But really, when you stop and think about what Christ did, how he stretched out his arms and he was on that cross for us, how can we not think about him? How can we not want to live this life? We want to be built differently. Don't you want to be the person when they say, wow, what is it about that person? He seemed to have this really living relationship with God. What is the difference? We want to be culture busters. We don't want to be culture followers. We want to have a higher standard of living in this world than what the world has for itself. And it's why we, along with Paul, ask that God would sanctify us through and through so that we would be built differently. Would you pray with me? Such awesome instructions, Lord, and really so difficult to follow. Father, I pray that all of us would step by step change who we are so that we would look like you. We would be built differently than the world. We'd be built like you. Father, would you give us the capacity to love and serve, the capacity to hold back retort but to give love? It is only through your marvelous presence, Father, that we can do any of this. So we pray, I pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to be on this place and on these brothers and sisters in Christ. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.